A pleasant day to all of you. Me and my classmates are going to discuss our modified case presentation entitled Twin Cephalic Baby 1 and Complete Breach Baby 2 with Hypertension. The reporters for this presentation are Miss Kathleen K. Tabutabo, Miss Reina Tagalog, Miss Julia Tavis, and yours truly, Miss Margil Amtaham. So stop on what you're doing and focus on our discussion right now. Before we begin, I ask everyone to bow down their heads and let us ask for the holy guidance of our God. Gracious, kind, and heavenly Father, Father, we come to your throne of grace at this very moment. We ask for forgiveness for all of the sins that we have committed against you in words and thoughts and in deeds. Father, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be upon us. Please give us um, wisdom, help us to discuss our... This our topics, Father, appropriately in a understandable manner, Father, that our classmates will be able to comprehend it. Father, um, please be upon us always. Thank you for your love and for your grace. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, let me present the minor contents in this presentation. So, these are the nurse of vision, mission, goals, and core values. Next is the Synthes vision, mission, goals, and objectives. Then, the BSN level 2 objectives and the table of contents. For our topic placement, participants, topic description, rotation, our topic title is Twin Cephalic Baby 1 and Complete Breach Presentation Baby 2 with Hypertension. Our placement is second semester school year 2021 to 2022 and BSN level 2 section A postpartum or gynae first rotation group are the participants. Topic description. This case presentation includes a detailed explanation of a twin pregnancy, baby 1 is cephalic while baby 2 is completely breached. Furthermore, the mother is hypertensive. The definition, signs, and symptoms, risk factors, potential complications, anatomy, and physiology of the body parts involved, pathophysiology, medications that a physician may prescribe, necessary laboratory and diagnostic examinations, medical and nursing management, and three different nursing care plans applicable to this condition will also be discussed. Rotation is postpartum or gynae rotation. Now, for our general objectives, at the end of the postpartum or gynae ward class, the students will be able to, for the knowledge, demonstrate knowledge about the nursing care of the pregnant mother with the twins that is in complete breach and cephalic presentation postpartum period. Discuss the necessary information to assess the family and the readiness to care for the twins at home. Skills. Give health teachings clearly to mothers and family with the twins about their care during postpartum period and the newborn. Professionally do and teach the interventions that can help in lowering the mother's hypertension. Communicate effectively, especially in answering queries of mothers about the care of their newborns during postpartum period. Attitude. Work in a cooperative manner with mothers. Maintain an honest and sincere demeanor when teaching mothers about health. Now for our specific objectives. After four hours of discussion about the modified case presentation, the students will be able to First, define the cephalic and different breach presentation and how it occurs. Elucidate the different intricacies that can possibly occur postpartum with a mother who gave birth to a twin. Discuss the anatomy and physiology of the different parts of the structure of the human body involved are affected when the patient is pregnant with a twin with a presentation of cephalic and complete breach. Elucidate the different complications that can occur to a mother with hypertension. Recognize and trace the pathophysiology and etiology 
of the provided case. Then, list the different drugs that physicians will possibly prescribe and distinguish their mode of action. Identify the laboratory exams required and compare the patient's results to the normal values. Determine the different diagnostic exams that the patient will possibly have if she gave birth to a twin encephalic and complete breech presentation with hypertension. Then, formulate correct nursing diagnosis and apply appropriate interventions if the situation arises in their patient's future clinical duties. Hang in there because we are just beginning. Now for the overview or introduction of our topic, multiple gestations are a pregnancy issue because a woman's body must adjust to the impacts of multiple fetuses. Multiple births have increased considerably due to in vitro fertilization that still account for between 10% or 3% of all deliveries. Twins occur at approximately 1 in every 80 births. In the United States, triplets occur at roughly 1 in every 8,000 births. So those are fun facts. Identical twins or monozygotic are formed from a single ovum and spermatozoon. The zygote separates into two identical individuals during fusion or one of the earliest cell divisions. Single ovum twins usually have one placenta, one chorion, two amnions, and two umbilical cords. Let us take note that twins are always identical in gender in identical twins. Now for the fraternal twins. Two-thirds of twins are fraternal or dizygotic or non-identical, resulting in two separate eggs being fertilized by two distinct spermatozoa, possibly not from the same sexual partner. They are also called double ova twins for these twins came from two eggs and not in one egg. So, these are fraternal twins. So, possible na there are two fathers in this um, twins. So, now, double ova twins have two placentas, two chorions, two amnions, and two umbilical cords. Twins may be identical or dissimilar in sex. By ultrasound or when the babies are born, it can be hard to tell if twins are identical or fraternal. The two fraternal placentas may fuse and look like one big placenta. Many pregnancies of two or to eight children may be conceived using a single egg, multiple ova, or a combination of the two. Today, the majority of pregnancies arise as a result of several ova being implanted in the vetro fertility procedure. So that's the case for today. The more parity in age a woman has, the more likely she will have numerous gestations. Inheritance appears to play a role in natural dizygotic weaning. This pattern of occurrence called familial maternal. Weight and age also affects the chance of a mother to conceive a twin. During multiple gestations, anemia and pregnancy-induced hypertension develop faster than typical. So gestational hypertension is a form of high blood pressure in pregnancy, and their patient in this modified case presentation experience this hypertension because she have twins and also her um her habits um affects or obesity or weight affects this condition to diagnose them it is critical to regularly monitor the woman's hematocrit level and blood pressure during labor and while awaiting cesarean surgery. Additionally, we do a diagnostic check called ultrasonography and laboratory tests such as complete blood count and urinalysis. One of the CBC's function is to determine the mother's hematocrit. 
assess the woman carefully in the early postpartum period since her uterus may have more difficulty contracting than usual due to the multiple gestations, putting her at risk for bleeding from uterine atony or lacking normal tone. Additionally, if labor or delivery is extended, uterine infection rises. The babies need a rigorous examination to ascertain the real gestational age and to rule out the possibility of twin to twin transfusion. Good day everyone, my name is Kathleen Kate F. Tabotabo and now I will discuss to you the anatomy and physiology of our case today, specifically the systems involved in this um, pregnancy. So without further ado, let us begin. So our case is a twin cephalic baby 1 and a complete breech presentation baby 2 with hypertension pregnancy. And we have five systems that are involved in this case. First is the central nervous system. Second is the cardiovascular system, the urinary system, the endocrine system, and the reproductive system. So first is we will be discussing the central nervous system. So the nervous system is the body's main communication and control system. Many physiological functions are controlled by it in conjunction with the endocrine system. So this is the reason why endocrine is also involved in this um, anatomy and physiology discussion. So the neurological st system responds quickly and quickly, while the endocrine system responds slowly but frequently and more consistently. So to preserve equilibrium or to preserve the what we call homeostasis, the two systems collaborate. Homeostasis is a very important factor in our body that will help our mother to gain um, her normal bodily functions. So for the central nervous system, so we have there our picture. So it is always known that when we speak about central nervous system, it will always be the brain and the spinal cord of a human. So the brain and spinal cord make up the central nervous system. So sensory informations are processed and integrated by the central nervous system. So they receive data and it must be analyzed. Then either saved to be dealt with the later or instantly acted upon with one or more motor responses. For example, if this is the hypothalamus, which we will discuss further later, so it is a part of the CNS as we all know it, and it will receive and evaluate the sense of the temperature change, for example, and then take appropriate action into it. So homeostasis will enter in this case. So if there is a temperature change in our body, so homeostasis will act and allow the body to go back to its normal temperature. So next is for the brain. So the brain weighs um, around uh, 1,450 to 1,600 grams and is located in the cranial cavity. So it receives the 50% of the cardiac output of the body and the arteries receive, uh, serving the brain are arranged in a unique pattern. So um, this unique pattern is the picture I've pasted here. So it is called the um, circle of Willis. So this design is guaranteed that blood pressure in both parts of the brain remains constant. So there will be an alternative route accessible if one of the arteries serving the brain become restricted. So as you can see here, there are um, arteries in the two parts of our brain from the two hemispheres divided. And so these uh, veins are arteries rather are important to ensure the critical delivery of our oxygen and nutrients to the brain. So our brain again requires oxygen and carbohydrates to function. So the, here it is the bigger picture of it. See we have here our um, circle of Willis. Okay so next is our cerebrum so it is a part of our brain. So this is the brain's biggest structure. So it is a longitudinal cerebral fissure fissure so that separates the left and right hemisphere so here 
so th there are four lobes in each um, hemisphere so we will be further discussing um, this four lobes which are the occipital frontal parietal and temporal so the cerebral cortex is the gray layer that covers the outside of our cerebrum and the layers underneath are made up of white matter the nerve fibers and uh, earlier the gray layer are the nerve cell bodies so the interneurons make up the cerebral cortex which is responsible for our conscious mind and the cerebral cortex again is divided into two four functional regions which are the occipital frontal parietal and temporal that we will be discussing next slide so here so we have our frontal this is our cerebral cortex so this is our um cerebral cortex here parietal lobe the thalamus occipital cerebellum brainstem which we will also discuss later the medulla the pons we will discuss also their function so next is uh, the occipital lobe so the occipital lobe is a part of the brain that is responsible for understanding understanding the visual stimuli and information so from the word itself occipital so for the sense of our sight so it is placed at the back of our head the occipital lobe houses the primary visual cortex which receives and processes information from the eyes ret retinas so visual issues such as difficulty of recognizing objects and ability to distinguish color and difficulty of recognizing words can all be caused if the occipital lobe is damaged so that is the importance of our occipital lobe next is for the frontal lobe and for its function it is for our motor abilities our higher level cognition and for our expressive language so the motor cortex is located near the central sulcus uh, in the back of our frontal lobe so the motor cortex collects information from the brain's multiple lobes so it collects information from our brain's multiple lobes and uses it to carry out physical action so that is the purpose of our frontal lobe so if um, there are changes in sexual behavior socializing and attentiveness so it does uh, it means that there is um, uh, our frontal lobe uh, is damaged next is our parietal lobe so what is the main function of it so it is responsible for the processing of our tactile sensory so what is tactile so it is our um, pressure of uh, our sense of, of touch if we can um, feel texture if we can feel pressure if we can feel pain so the, in, in the parietal lobe, we have the somatosensory cortex, a part of the brain responsible for processing of the body's senses. So it is located in this lobe, the parietal lobe. So for the last lobe, it is the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe's main function is, for, is, it, is it is responsible for comprehending sounds and language. So the hippocampus, which is found in the temporal lobe, explains why this area of the brain is so important for the memory function because memory speech perception and language can all be affected if the temporal lobe is um, damaged so that is uh, for the four regions of the each hemispheres of our brain so we have the occipital for vision frontal for our cognition our language um, parietal for our tactile sensory and for temporal for comprehending the uh, sounds and language as well as it plays a, um, a role for the memory of a person so next is one of the part of the brain is the diencephalon so which ha it has three um, structures so the thalamus act as rela relay station for sensory impulses and um, also has a role in memory next is the hypothalamus which is what I've um, introduced earlier so it is uh, associated with the pituitary gland and produce two hormones which is very important in our case so the antidiuretic hormone the one that regulates the water level in our body and the oxytocin the one who simulates contraction for our mother during pregnancy so it has many functions such as 
um, controlling body temperature, so the homeostasis, control of autonomic nervous system, control of fluid balance, which is the uh, duty of our ADH, the control of appetite associated with the limbic system dealing with emotional reactions, as well as the control of sexual behaviors. So the epithalamus, the last um, part of the diencephalon, is it secretes hormone called melatonin, which is a very familiar word for us, responsible for our sleep-wake cycle. So um, there is a word that can be mistaken sometimes, which is melanin, but melatonin is for our sleep-wake uh, sleep cycles. However, the melanin is the dark spots we can see in our skin. So next is the brainstem. So this is the brainstem. So we have there the thalamus, midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord. So we will be discussing the brainstem with the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. So for the uh, midbrain, so it is a conduction pathway, which means the um, electric uh, impulses will of messages will be uh, moving in this path. So it connects to the cerebrum with the lower brain structure and spinal cord. So for the pons, it is also a conduction pathway for communication with the cerebellum. Okay, so for the midbrain is a pathway that connects to the cerebrum and pons for the um, cerebellum. So the uh, pons work with the medulla oblongata and control for the depth and rate of our respiration. Next is the medulla oblongata. So again, it is a relay station for sensory nerves going to the cerebrum. The, medu the, the medu medulla contains the autonomic centers such as cardiac centers, respiratory, those um, centers that are involuntary where we cannot control. Just like the vasomotor center with coughing, sneezing, and vomiting center. The medulla is also a site for the decussation of the pyramidal tracts. This means that the right side of the body is controlled by our left cerebral hemisphere and vice versa. So that is the function of our um, brainstem, the medulla pons, and the midbrain. Next is the cerebellum. So we are also done discussing the cerebrum. Now we can proceed to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is also known as small brain and is located behind the brainstem on the top of the pons. So here. So it is made up of tiny lobes that perform a variety of activities. So its main function is it gets data from the inner ears balancing system, the sensory nerves, and the, the auditory and visual systems. And it is important in both movement coordination and motor learning. So it is also linked to motor movement and control, although not because motor commands originate here. Instead, the cerebellum modifies the signals to ensure that the motor mo movements are precise and effective so that we humans will not lose balance and can result to injury. So the cerebellum aids in the regulation of our posture as well. The balance, the voluntary movements, coordination, and this enables our body our muscle groups to grow and work together to produce smooth movements that is coordinated. So the cerebellum um, involves in a variety of cognitive tasks including speech in addition to motor control. So next one is the spinal cord. So we have the um, illustration here. The average adult spinal cord is up to 42 to 45 centimeters long and it spans from the medulla oblongata to the upper section of the second lumbar uh, vertebra. So the, the spinal cord is protected in the vertebral canal, which is a bony ring that surrounds the cord. The spinal meninges, which are, which are three layers of connective tissues, or connective tissues rather, that wraps the spinal cord, the, they constitute to one another as a protective layer. So these are the pia mater, the innermost layer, the arachnoid matter, the middle layer, and the dura matter, the outermost layer. A central canal as well as the gray and white matter make up the spinal cord. So the CSF or our um, cerebral um, spinal fluid is found in the central canal and the spinal meninges. The water portions are made up of axon and neurons which, they, which convey signals up and down the cord through ascending and descending tracks. 
So the gray matter is largely made up of cell bodies such as the neurons and their dendrites. And as these fibers enter and depart the brain, they cross, which explains why the right side of the brain controls the left side and the left side of the brain controls the left side of our body. So that is all for the central nervous system and why it is considered as one of the systems involved in this pregnancy. Because as we all know, in the hypothalamus, which is part of the CNS, produces uh, these hormones. And according to a study in, an, in Netherlands and Spain, which I will post the link uh, below, in 2016 that when there is pregnancy which means there are fluctuations of surge of hormones and that will cause to the shrinking of the mother's brain as well as result to volume loss and will result will result to neurologic dysfunction such as interneural hypertension epilepsy and even um uh csf or congenital heart failure that is connected in our cardiovascular system so that is why the cns or the central nervous system is very important in this pregnancy because uh, as i've as the purpose that i've said later from the um, senses to the, our balance to our speech it plays a crucial role on how a human deals in their daily life so next is the cardiovascular system so it is mixed uh, circulatory and the cardiovascular system uh, refers to the blood arteries while the circulatory refers to the heart. Then uh, the heart which pumps blood and then the, and the blood will go to the arteries that transports the blood to the body and return it to the heart, which are the two essential components, the blood, arteries, and uh, the heart. So this is how the nutrients like oxygen and waste like carbon dioxide are um, pushed out of the organs due to uh, cellular respiration. So this is the usual cycle of our um, the, our cellular respiration. So when the blood comes out from the lungs, it will be received by our pulmonary veins, our left atrium, but through the bicuspid valve, left ventricle, aorta, then it will deliver to our body tissues, then going back to the inferior vena cava, late atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary veins, arteries, and then back again to the lungs, and it is a continuous cycle. And since we are talking about pregnancy, it means that if there is another life in our body, there will be the changes in our circulatory system. So this is the circulatory uh, fetal circulation. So this is all from the mother. However, there is one, um, uh, um, another one involved which will deliver the um, nutrients, the blood, uh, oxygenated blood or baby, which is through the placenta and from the umbilical arteries when it is already consumed by our babies, go, it will enter again to the umbilical vein and it is still a cycle from the mother going to our um, fetus so the heart is about size of our fist which makes uh, makes sense because when a person is bigger uh, has a bigger fist thus they have a bigger heart so we have here so it is shaped like a cone and slightly uh, shifted sits slightly shifted over the left side in the uh, mediastinum which is the middle of the cavity or thorax so it sits on top of the diaphragm which is the main muscle that helps breathing so it is behind the sternum or our breastbone so um, since our case has hypertension it is most important to know the risk of hypertension because it is a type of a cardiovascular disease this includes coronary artery disease ventricular hypertrophy um, vulvular heart disease as well as cardiac arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, cerebral stroke, and renal failure. The continuous um, relationship between blood pressure and cardiovascular as well as the renal events makes the distinction between high normal, higher normal blood pressure and hypertension based on the arbitrary cutoff values for blood pressure. So that is why hypertension is one of the um, most uh, um, 
most observed condition for our patient because it might cause disruption to our mother system and as for pregnancy women the pregnancy hypertensive disorders are most frequent medical problems again of pregnancy pregnancy rather affecting 5% to 10% of all pregnancies so it has uh, long been assumed that all complications associated with gestational hypertension are resolved within the first six weeks after the delivery. However, prenatal hypertension, which is the case of our patient in this um, case presentation, uh, she has a high prenatal um, blood pressure, so particularly, particularly preeclampsia has been linked to a risk of this hypertension, and it may lead to stroke, CHD, and a venous thromboembolism later in life if not aided. So we've discussed in the cardiovascular system that the cardiovascular, endocrine, and the renal system are all connected when we talk about how hypertension. So first is we will be discussing it here in our urinary system. So the two kidneys, we have two ureters, a urinary bladder. We have our um, urinary bladder and the urethra make up our the women's urinary system so the kidneys alone conduct the aforementioned duties and produce urine whereas the other organs of the urinary system serve as the temporary storage reservoir for urine or as the transportation pathways for it move from one bodily location to another so the, these kidneys are essential for maintaining equilibrium or again our homeostasis so they manage the fluid in our body and eliminate waste through outflow of our urine. So they filter vital elements uh, from the blood such as sodium as part of their job and potassium as well as reabsorbing chemicals that are necessary in maintaining our homeostasis. So any non-essential chemicals will be um, excreted through urine. Um, in addition, secreting hormones like renin and erythropoietin erythropoietin the kidneys have an endocrine function so it is still connected to our endocrine system so during pregnancy um, it is expected that there will be frequent uh, trips to the bathroom because it is one of the indicators of pregnancy so also pregnancy hormones for example cause our kidneys to grow and generate more urine allowing our body to eliminate additional waste more quickly and also the BB size so it will press down the blood urine and will result for the mother to urinate frequently such as BB out uh, to 7 to 10 pounds baby you now they grow and press the blood there causing the mother to um, go to the bathroom more frequently and how it is connected to high blood pressure so High blood pressure causes the blood vessels to constrict, causing damage and weakness through the body, including the kidneys in our urinary system. Then, blood flow is slowed by constriction, and with that, there will be kidney failure. So, our kidneys may stop working correctly if the blood arteries in them are damaged. The kidneys are unable to eliminate all waste and excess fluid, so they will retain the fluid and it will not be excreted from the body and with this extra fluid it will can elevate the extra fluid in our blood vessels it will um, elevate the blood pressure even higher resulting to um, even higher levels of hypertension that is very alarming so this produces deadly cycle that can lead to renal failure and further harm of our client so if our mother is overworked um, she will uh, there will be a um, faster pumping of the blood as well as the circulation thus the blood pressure will be higher that can lead to um, serious hypertension or worse uh, congenital heart failure or even that if not aided so that is the, the duty of the urinary system in this case next is the endocrine system so the organs of the endocrine system are small and attractive compared to other system. However, they are highly spectacular because their role maintains hemostasis, which is considered as um, a very important task. And those organs 
are genius giants. They may not be giant in size, but in function, they are very important. The major endocrine organs of the body include the pituitary, the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenal, pineal, and thymus gland, the pancreas also, and the gonads. So these various endocrine um, glands produce hormones into the bloodstream, making up the endocrine system. So hormones connect to a receptor on the cell membrane or within the cell when they reach their target cell. And the target cell responds by changing the behavior. So at the end of the day, the endocrine system aids in the, in the establishment of the homeostasis or a sense of balance even when the external environment, there are changes. Then during pregnancy, a woman endocrine system undergoes um, changes. Progesterone, estrogen level rise throughout the pregnancy. With estrogen generated by the placenta and progesterone produced by the corpus luteum linked later to the placenta. So, endocrine system is a very important um, system for pregnancy since um, uh, it um, produces hormones that are essential for every mother during their course of pregnancy. Then, how, wa how endocrine system is connected to hypertension. So, endocrine is a subset of hypertension induced by a hormonal imbalance, which is most like commonly affects the pituitary and adrenal gland. For example, if it is a disease called hyperthyroidism, that too much excretion of the um, um, hormones of the thyroid can result to uh, fast palpitations of the heart and thus results to um, high blood uh, pressure and to aid this we must take anti-pituitary um, medications to um, stop pituitary from sending commands to our um, thyroid gland to produce more home hormones so that we can be um, uh, aided by high blood pressure so patients with a significant family history of hypertension adrenal tumors or low potassium level or hypokalemia um, develops hypertension before the age of 30 should be evaluated by endocrine hypertension patients with uncontrolled blood pressure while taking three or um, more blood pressure drugs must also be evaluated for contraindications so that is for our endocrine system so it is more on hormonal um, function the endocrine system that um, are essential for pregnancy as well as for the high blood pressure lastly is the reproductive system a very important one so the female reproductive system is designed to serve a variety of purpose as we all know it so it produces ova the egg cells necessary for reproduction um, for fertilization fertiliza fertilization um, along with the sperm and egg when they are um, um, conceived so it takes place in the fallopian tube then the next step for the fertilized egg is to implant in the uterine walls and begin the phase of pregnancy aside from the task listed or the task i've um, mentioned the creation also of sex hormones are necessary for are also made here for necessary production our reproductive um, cycle to continue so we have here our vagina the opening of the vulva vestibule so the opening of the reproductive system you have the uterus where our baby uh, the fertilized egg will be implanted and the baby will grow we have there the cervix and the corpus luteum the fallopian tubes where the fertilization takes place the ovaries where the ova or the eggs are released and housed also for female sex hormones the regulation of woman's cycle in pregnancy are also produced by the ovaries such as progesterone and estrogen are the two of these hormones and with the collaboration of our endocrine system so reproduction is one of the most important and necessary characteristic of the living organs to reproduction so in this phrase this is uh, the same with the introduction so we will proceed to the next slide so since our patient um, already is G4P3 and now G4P5, it is considered as multiple pregnancies. And many doctors who treat multiple pregnancies 
believes that reducing the activity and increasing rest lengthen, length na, lengthens and improves the outcomes of these pregnancy. So, routine hospitalization for bed rest and multiple pregnancies, on the other hand, has not been found to reduce the risk of premature birth. Women who are pregnant with high-order multiples are usually advised to avoid intense activities and work between the ages of 20 to 24 um, weeks, the age of gestation. So, bed rest increase uterine blood flow, which may aid the fetal, the fetal growth issues. Um, when bed rest is prescribed, intercourse is generally discouraged. So, it um, simply and specifically means that when our patient already had multiple pregnancies, birth control is very important because it is not only the um, reproductive system is on um, tall, however, also the, the central nervous system and the cardiovascular system. So again, um, too much pressure will lead to cardiovascular diseases and might lead to death and not only for the mother but also for the fetal growth of the um, infant will be affected if this condition such as hypertension if multiple pregnancies are not regulated and it will surely result to worse cases but hopefully um, with proper interventions it will be aided and that is all for the um, anatomy and physiology all the systems involved in our case in this um, presentation now I will pass the floor to my group mate to discuss uh, the physical assessment of our client, um, MCA. Thank you. Hello, good day. I am Julia V. Tevis, and I will now be presenting Chapter 8 uh, of the Modified Case Presentation, which is the physical assessment. So next slide, please. We have on our next slide the biographic data of the patient. Name of the patient, MCA. The residential location or address is Lamogo, Manhuyod, Negros Oriental. The personal contact number is not applicable. The current age of patient MCA is 39 years old. The birth date is April 10 of 19, uh, 1982. Sex is female. The languages spoken are Filipino and Cebuano. The dialect spoken is Cebuano, the nationality is Filipino, civil status is single, the educational attainment, a high school graduate, the religion of the patient is Aglipay, the occupation is farmer, health insurance is uh, PhilHealth, and the provider of history, and the sources of information for the um, interview for the data is, uh, are the patient and her live-in partner, which are both reliable. Next slide, please. So on our, uh, here on our slide, we can see the reasons for seeking health care. So the patient, MCA, had recurring contractions at around 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. of March 31, 2022. The patient reported pain from the upper to lower back and uh, reported discomfort, which worsened as she moved. The patient's blood pressure rate or BP rate was taken at Manhuyod RHU or the Manhuyod Rural Health Unit, and the BP rate uh, taken there was 150 over 90 mmHg. The patient traveled at 6 a.m. of March 31, 2022 from um, at 6 a.m. of that date from Manhuyod to Negros Oriental Provincial Hospital. Next slide, please. So for the history of present illness, the patient, MCA, weighed 80 kilograms at admission, a twin cephalic breech pregnancy case. The patient's husband reported she had no infection during her pregnancy. Patient's husband also reported that the patient has high blood pressure during the prenatal until they were transferred to Negros Oriental Provincial Hospital 
from an, from the Manhuyad Rural Health Unit. The case was attended by Dr. Abuan in Negros Oriental Provincial Hospital. The patient is reportedly showing signs of hypertension during labor and birth. The patient's baseline blood pressure rate is 160 over 80 MMHG 160 over 80 MMHG according to her live-in partner. And this is the first time MCA experienced twin pregnancy. Next slide, please. So we will see on our next slide the current health status of the patient. So the current health status, patient MCA, age 39 years old, with a vital sign of uh, temperature 36.2 degrees Celsius, pulse rate 121, respiration rate 32, uh, blood pressure 140 over 110 mmHg. The patient reports discomfort when standing and walking. The patient has active assisted range of motion and reports she needs assistance when standing and going to the toilet. Overall, the health status of the patient is good. Next slide, please. So we will see on our next slide uh, the past uh, health history of the patient. Next slide, please, for the past health history of the patient. On the slide for the past health history of the patient, please. For the past health history, for childhood illness, there is no history of childhood illness reported. And for hospitalizations and surgeries, no history of hospitalizations and surgeries reported because for the uh, two, pre uh, two previous pregnancies, uh, I mean um, the three pre previous pregnancies, the patient uh, delivered um, her children or her babies at home. And for the serious injuries, no history of serious injuries or fractures. For serious or chronic illness, the client has hypertension. For immunizations, no history of immunizations. For allergies, no known food, drug, and environmental allergies reported. And for medications, no drug medications or maintenance taken. For travel, no recent domestic and international travels. And as for domestic, um, I, we mean um, no travels outside of Dumaguete City, uh, no travels outside of Negros Oriental, and no international travels. Next slide, please. So for our next slide, we have the general impression of the patient or the general impression of the client. Next slide, please, for the general impression of the client. So the patient is conscious and responsive. Patient is oriented to person, place, and time appropriate to the environment. The patient can hear clearly and can speak well. The patient is attentive in following instructions, and the patient is cooperative in answering questions. The patient is accompanied by her live-in partner, her mother, and her eldest daughter. So we are now done with this uh, uh, we are now proceeding to the second part of the physical assessment for the uh, head to toe assessment which will be reported by Miss um, Tagalog thank you very much so for the review of systems we have the general health survey the client was well groomed accordingly to the environment and situation the client was awake she avoids eye contact and has a low voice speech that indicates that she is not that confident. 
the client responds to the questions in an assertive way. The client claims that she doesn't feel any pain but numbness. The vital signs taken as follows. The BP 140 over 100, um, which is high. The pulse rate 121 beats per minute. Temperature 36.2 degrees Celsius. Respiratory, respiratory rate. So for the breast, there are no lumps, tumors, or lesions detected. There are no supernumerary nipples, and there is no familial disease of breast cancer. For the gastrointestinal system, the patient has no problems with defecation and has a yellow or brown form stools and no other problem. For the genitourinary system, no history of UGI, urinary tract infection, and kidney stones. The urine has cloud, is cloudy yellow in color. For the female reproductive system, there is no bleeding. However, there is inflammation. So um, this is actually, there is an inflammation reported and there is no history of reproductive problem. For the musculoskeletal system, no history of musculoskeletal disease, no fracture or birth, birth injuries. For the neurological system, the no sensory disturbances reported, but she verbalizes she, she can feel numbness. For the endocrine system, there is no intolerance of, to heat or cold, nor is there any increase in thirst, urine, or appetite. Diabetes or thyroid illnesses do not run in the family. Immune or hematologic system, there have been no reports of enlarged lymph nodes or glands. There is no history of blood loss. There are no bleeding problems, recurrent infections, or transfusion histories. So for the um, for the head, there is no dandruffs and lead scenes, no lesions, deformities, lumps noted. So there is no abnormalities detected. The the face, normal configuration, no, no abnormalities detected for the eyes. Um, eyes are symmetrical. Pupil size is approximately 2 mm in natural light. Both pupils constrict if, fly, if heat by an artificial light and also have the other people who are not exposed to the light constrict. So there is no abnormality that are detected detected for the nose they um, the nose is symmetrical nostrils are patterned mucous membranes are pink no abnormalities detected for the ears there are no abnormalities detected as well normal configuration if thin pearl gums appear pink and moist for the mouth normal mobility for the neck umbilicus and is midline without um, herniation for the abdomen, cylindrical and symmetrical in shape. Lung and chest, the ribs are flexible and slight sternal retraction during respiration. The, the patient has two nipples. Um, for the skin, adequate hydration, pinkish, uh, pinkish in color. The abnormality of it, the patient manifests lesions on her face, but um, not too suspicious. So specifically, postules are evident from facial acne and warts. So for the genitalia, normal configuration, mucus, vaginal discharge, um, and no abnormalities detected. For the anus, the anus is patent, no abnormalities detected. For the extremities, the arms, legs, hands, feet, hips, and spinal column, no birth fractures, symmetrical in length. Extremities can be flexed. The spinal column is C-shaped. Shaped. For the vital signs, um, the respiration is abnormal, 22 ppm. The temperature is normal, 36.2 degrees Celsius. The pulse rate is abnormal, 121 ppm. And the blood pressure is abnormal, 140 over 100. So for the reflexes, for the blink reflex, it is present. The rooting reflex is present as well. The sucking reflex is present. The swallowing reflex is present. Extrusion reflex is present. Palmar reflex is present as well. The step walk in place reflex is present. 
the placing reflex is present, plantar grasp reflex is present, tonic neck reflex is present. For the moral reflex, we um, it is also present. Babinski reflex is present. Magnet reflex is present. Cross extension reflex is present. Trunk incurvation reflex is present. Langau reflex is present. Deep tendon reflex is present. And finally, the tonic neck reflex is also present. For the bubble head assessment, we have the breast. So upon the assessment process, there is no manifestations of cracking or fissures on areola or nipple. No masses or tenderness in breast tissues. The breasts are soft at first, then firm. So for the uterus, upon the assessment process, the estimated blood loss was 400 ml. The fundus is midline and palpable halfway between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. By approximately 6 hours post-delivery, the fundus is firm at the level of the umbilicus. For the bladder, upon the assessment process, the mother urinated 160 ml for approximately 6 hours after the delivery. She doesn't have tr trouble voiding. For the bowel, upon the assessment, she defecates few hours after giving, giving birth and describe her bowel movement as lodges due to stretch muscles and the side effects of some pain medications. For the leukia, the color is leukia rubra, was dark red, that lasts for about three and a half days. The first discharge was composed of blood, shreds of fetal membranes, decidua, vernix cachosa, lanugo, and membranes. For the other, there is no foul odor detected. The amount the leukia saturation was six inches, six, six inch stain with having an amount of 45 ml estimated blood loss. For the blood clot, few small blood clots that are no larger than a clot. For the episiotomy or laceration, the client did not undergo episiotomy upon giving birth. So for the hemoma signs, hemorrhoids, upon the assessment of the calf of the legs, she felt no tenderness in the calf and has equal circumference. There is no manifestation of swelling, pain, increased warmth, or erythema. No skin discoloration and both legs have the same temperature. There is no abnormal swelling in the rectum region. For the emotional status, upon the assessment process, the mother is in a state of intense feeling of joy, exhaustion, fatigue, confusion, loneliness, disappointment, anger, fear, and happiness. For discomfort, the mother verbalized wala ramay kuy di batik na sakit pero mura kong mali kong kumutindog. Pinahanglan jud na yung mutabang na ko labi na muad sa CR kay Manihi. Unya ang laya akong lawas. So that's it for the physical assessment. Hello, I'm back. Let us now proceed to the functional health patterns of the patient. For the health perception or health management, so the initial assessment are the following. So her husband claimed that his wife is hypertensive six months starting her pregnancy. Her husband claimed that his wife has no food and medicine allergies. Her husband claimed that his wife is inactive. She only exercises or walk often once a week for 5 to 10 minutes. Her husband claimed that his wife is maintaining good hygiene. She takes a bath every morning, but sometimes she forgot to brush her teeth after a meal. Her husband claimed that his wife has 8 hours of sleep daily and she drinks at least 8 glasses of water daily also. Her husband claimed that his wife has not been smoking and drinking any liquors or alcoholic beverages. Her husband claimed that his wife is taking medications for her hypertension and vitamins as prescribed by her physician and 
he is the one who assists his wife to make sure that she was able to take right medications on time with right dosage. So her husband claimed that his wife is already fully vaccinated with Sinovac against COVID-19. Now, for the initial assessment, so her husband claimed that the patient is in a healthy diet, eating a lot of vegetables, and she is eating fruits. Her husband claimed that the patient is um, totally weak due to the process of labor that she experienced. Her husband claimed that his wife follows properly all the doctor's order and her husband claimed that he is worried about his wife's condition. Now, for the nutritional metabolic pattern of the patient. Usual health pattern. So the usual daily food intake of the patient is at breakfast, um, the patient eat one to two cups of rice, one serving of stir-fried vegetables, one glass of water. For snack, the patient eats five pieces of bread usually, and for lunch, the patient eats usually one to two cups of rice, one serving of boiled vegetable soup, and one glass of water. For the snack, three pieces of sweet potatoes. Dinner, one cup of rice, one cup of fried fish, one glass of water. The fluid intake of, patient, of the patient is usually 2,000 um, cc of fluid daily. So that is the usual daily um, metabolic or nutritional metabolic pattern of the patient. Then, vitamins and supplements. The patient takes 500 mg of ascorbic acid and 500 mg of ferrosulfate daily. So the patient also claimed to have a good appetite every meal, claimed that she had gained weight and height. So during July, um, the height of the patient is 151.5 cm and the weight is 70 kg. And in August, the height of the patient became 152 cm and the weight became 80 kg. The patient claimed to have no food allergies, claimed to have restriction on eating junk foods, street foods, and soft drinks. And the vital signs or the usual vital signs of the patient is or are the temperature 36.5 degrees Celsius, the pulse rate is 80 beats per minute, respiration is 20, the blood pressure is 100 over 80. So that is the usual um, metabolic health pattern of the patient. Now, initial assessment. So the usual daily food intake as verbalized by her youngest daughter. So for your breakfast, the patient eats one cup of rice, one serving of pinakbe, and one half glass of water. For snacks, so the patient eats one piece of banana. For lunch, one half cup of rice, sauteed vegetables, and uh, one half glass of water. For the snack, the patient eats two slices of whole wet bread. And for dinner, one cup of purge, one glass of water, and one piece of ripe banana. So the daily fluid intake as verbalized now by her husband, is 2,000 cc of fluid a day. Her youngest daughter claimed that her mother has no food allergies. Her youngest daughter claimed that her mother can't eat alone. She requires um, assistance when eating. So the vital signs of the patient, the initial vital signs, are for the temperature 36.2 um, degrees Celsius of a 
Pulse rate is 131 beats per minute. Respiration is 22. Blood pressure is 140. Over 100. Um, millimeters of mercury. And the height is 152 centimeter. And the weight is 80 kilogram. For the elimination pattern, usual health patterns. Um, for the bowel elimination, so the patient defecates two times a day as claimed by her husband. So the husband claimed that the patient has no difficulty upon defecation. So the characteristics of the stool, so it is um, brownish and formed. So the patient also do not use laxatives as claimed. Now for urinary elimination, the patient urinates usually 6 to 10 times a day as claimed by the patient herself. The amount of urine per urination is about 90 millimeter um, as claimed and claimed to have no difficulty upon urination. So the characteristic of the urine is pale yellow and the skin in the skin there's no excessive perspiration and no foul body odor. Initial assessment. Bowel elimination. So, the, her husband claimed that his wife defecates once a day. Her husband claimed that his wife has diaper because she has difficulty going to the bathroom. Her husband um, also claimed that the characteristic of his wife's stool is brownish and it is formed. So, her husband um, claimed that his wife does not use any laxatives. And for the urinary elimination, her husband claimed that his wife's urine is about 800 ml every day. Her husband also claimed that the characteristics of his wife's urine is cloudy, slightly turbid, and aromatic. Now for activity exercise pattern, the usual health pattern of the patient are the following. So for the daily routine, the patient wakes up. At 5 a.m., cooks breakfast, eat breakfast, do household um, chores, eat lunch, eat dinner, and um, sleep. Then the patient claimed to have no enough energy for completing desired or required activities. So the exercise pattern of the patient um, is the patient claimed to walk or exercise rarely. So the leisure activities of the patient is gardening and talking with neighbors. Person ability for feeding is zero, bathing is zero, toileting is zero, bed mobility is zero, dressing is zero, grooming is zero, cooking is two, and home maintenance is two, shopping is two, and that's it. Initial assessment. The patient claimed that she is weak, does not have enough, um, enough energy, perceive and the perceived ability for feeding is 3, bathing is 3, toileting is 3, bad mobility is 3, dressing is 3, grooming is 3, and cooking is not applicable. Home maintenance is not applicable as well, and shopping is not applicable. Now for the sleep rest pattern, for the usual health pattern of the patient. So the husband verbalizes that his wife often starts to sleep at 9 p.m. The husband verbalized as well that his wife usually wakes up at around 5 a.m. So according to this um, statement, the number of sleeping hours is 8 hours. And the patient claimed to be ready for daily activities after sleep. Um, the patient uh, claimed that usually she have no sleeping problems. And also, the patient claimed to have no early awakening. And usually, um, takes short nap every afternoon for or I mean, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. as claimed by the patient herself. 
So, now for the initial half pattern, the, her husband claimed that his wife is asleep at 8 p.m. Her husband claimed that his wife is awake at 6 a.m. And her husband claimed that the number of sleeping hours of his wife is 10 hours. And her husband claimed that his wife is ready for treatment after sleep. Her husband claimed that the patient has early awakening sometimes because of the new environment, because the patient is in the hospital. Her husband claimed that his wife takes a short nap every morning at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and in afternoon from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. after birth. So for the cognitive per perceptual pattern of the patient, for the... Um, Usual assessment, so the patient claimed to have no hearing difficulties. The patient claimed to have a normal vision, did not wear any eyeglasses. And the patient claimed to have no change in the memory. And um, also, the patient claimed to have no concentration problems. And um, hang in there or near. So the patient claimed to learn things easily and with no difficulty learning. The patient claimed to have no pain and discomfort felt. Now for the initial assessment of the patient. So the patient claimed to have no hearing difficulties also. The patient claimed to have a normal vision and she did not wear any eyeglasses, just like her usual um, health assessment. The patient claimed to have no change in memory. The patient claimed that she uh, can concentrate sometimes. And also, um, the patient claimed to learn things easily still and with no difficulty in learning. So the patient claimed that she is not uh, comfortable and feels tired because she just gave uh, birth to a tweet. Now, before we proceed to the remaining functional health patterns of the patient, let us answer this one question to assure that we will uh, not be sleepy throughout the next discussion and to wake up all our um, nerves. Char. So let us read the question. So the question is, which among the choices below does not belong to the 11 functional health patterns? So here are the choices. A, sleep rest pattern. B, activity exercise pattern. C, eating pattern. And D, health perception. What's your answer? So if your answer is letter C, um, the eating pattern, you are correct. That, that does not belong to the 11 functional health patterns. So congratulations. And now let's proceed to the discussion, which are the remaining um, functional patterns of the patient that will be discussed by Ms. Kathleen Tabutabo. Good day everyone, my name is Kathleen Kate F. Tabotabo and now I will continue the 7 to 11 um, functional health problems and our um, case presentation. So for the 7th functional health problem, so it will be the self-perception or the self-concept of the patient. So this is where we will know how the patient sees herself um, in regards to her condition in her uh, pregnancy situation and for the usual assessment and initial first for the usual assessment first the patient describes herself as the same person despite the increase in body size so this is before our client gave birth or was admitted in the hospital so the patient also sees herself as a responsible mother the patient says that she has a good relationship with her partner and helped her um, become a better partner and mother through her course and this pregnancy. 
and then lastly the patient comes and seldom has a mood swing so this is before um, the pregnancy took place of how our client or our patient MCA handled her situation and as for the initial assessment so this is on March 31 2022 so in this time the patient verbalizes that um, I will read it in uh, layman's term so kad atong naburos ko medyo nitambok na ko o na ay mga itom itom sa akong lawas then the patient feels restless whenever she notices changes in her body next is the patient verbalizes that masukod yun ko anang dili tumanon akong sugo kanang sunlugon ko o kanang mamakaksang ko ah. and those are the things that triggers the emotions of our client and lastly how our client relaxes after this course of, of um, her situation so the patient relaxes through a rest and a glass of warm water so that is for our um, self-perception or for the self-concept of our patient next is for the eight functional health problem so this is the role relationship so this is our client's relationship relationship rather to um, her husband and her other daughters so for the usual assessment so the patient her husband and the kids live together so they are so the patient stays at home to take care of their kids while the husband works so i'm the one who interviewed uh, the family and the husband is a farmer so they had a um, small even though small but um, agricultural land but it can sustain their family so the patient usu usually opens up about her small problems to her younger sister and then no issues within the family and with her in-laws next is for the initial assessment so the patient lives again with his or uh, with her husband and their kids then the patient and her husband were both working before she was pregnant then the patient verbalizes that her family was happy when they knew that she was pregnant again with um her fifth child fourth and fifth child since it was twins then the patient verbalizes that both sides of their families were supportive of her throughout her pregnancy so that is for the role relationship of our patient so in addition to the usual uh, i mean initial assessment rather the patient also verbalizes that um Ako yung mga amiga na maadtoan sa mong balay kung like is sa balay. So, um, she has friends that will, um, where she can enjoy her leisure time to uh, um, relieve from stress. And also, the patient verbalizes, Bisag tulun ako ka anak, ikaw patog lima ning duha. Bisag sa kagamay sa kwarta rin gikan sa aning pagpananom since they are farmers. Salamat sa ginoo na maigurajud ang among income para mabuhi. With the patient and her family are active also in their community activities. And they are part of the officials in their small community groups in their barangay. So next is the sexuality reproduction. So for the usual assessment, the patient said that they are indeed sexually active with her husband and the patient claims that they use protection during intercourse. The patient had three pregnancies, pregnancies already and all of them are girls and it is stated that these girls were only delivered in their houses only and in her current situation, the twins, it is the only time where they went to um, hospital to seek uh, aid for the delivery of her children and she is a G4P3 which means um, she was already pregnant four times and before this twins will uh, be given birth she already had three children which is um, all our girls and as for the initial assessment so again our patient already gave birth with two um, baby girls which is twins and the patient states that both of them does not have any dysfunction um, sexually 
So, there are no uh, dysfunction in the reproductive system, both the mother and the husband. And the patient verbalizes, gagamit po may condom pills o sahay. However, um, they didn't manage to use um, when they conceived this two or the twins. Thus, our mother now has multiple cases of pregnancy. So the uh, LMP of our mother is last uh, June 17, 2021, last year. So the patient does not have any problems in her uh, menstruation, hence because she is still on the 13 um, plus age bracket. And now in the initial assessment, she is already G4 P5 after delivery. So for the 10th um, functional health problems, I'm uh, so sorry for the wrong number. So this is already the 10th one, which is the coping stress tolerance. As for the usual assessment, the patient relieves her anxiety by making sure that her kids will not experience hunger. Then the patient drinks water to calm down when adversity happens. So for the initial assessment, the patient verbalizes, wala may nahitabo na lain last year o ang gap sa last na ko na anak o ang kining kapit kay 9 years ma. The patient said that when she is pregnant, she experiences body pains. So the patient verbalizes, kung makuyawan ko, ako lang isurisuroy o giyong nanugtubi. The patient states that she shares her worries and problems to her husband. Next is for the last functional health problems of our case, which is the value belief pattern. As for the usual assessment, the patient defines her faith as the foundation of her life and her religion, um, her, and also for her family's religion, they are um, Aglipay or an uh, Iglesia, Iglesia rather, ni Cristo. Then for the initial assessment, the patient states that she hopes to have anything um, God bless them to have. The patient verbalizes that importante ka ayong pamilya o ang relihiyon sa koa. The patient states that prayers helped her lift her worries away. Then the patient said that there are no practices in the religion that contraindicates any hospital procedure during her pregnancy. And that is for that is all rather sorry that is all for all of the functional health problems in our um, modified case study in for our group. Hello again, Dr. Kual. Uh, we are now on the ninth chapter of our modified case presentation, which is the genogram. So again, this is Yulia V. Tevez, and I will be presenting the genogram of the patient. So we will be tracing both the maternal and paternal side. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, for the genogram. Okay, so here we see the genogram. So for our legend, a triangle is a male, circle is for female and if we see a triangle in a circle without any color or without any pattern it means no disease and if we see a circle with a diagonal line that refers to the patient um, on the second column if we see either a triangle or a circle marked with red or it is shaded with red it means um, hypertensive the person is hypertensive and if we see either a triangle or a circle marked with blue or shaded with blue, it means the person is diabetic. And if we see this X symbol, it means the, the person is already dead or deceased. And for a diamond with a line in the middle, it refers to or it signifies or it symbolizes multiple gestation. And now let us begin uh, the tracing of the maternal and paternal side. Let us begin with the paternal side. So on our first row, 
on the top most row, we have um, our male, which is uh, a male patient, 98 years old, hypertensive, and already deceased. And for the female, on the paternal side, um, multiple gestation, because there is a uh, diamond um, with a middle in between, the person is already deceased, uh, 97 years old. And below that, um, they have uh, four children. Um, the first or the eldest is seven, as a male, 78 years old, without disease. Without disease, that's without disease. The second uh, child is a male, um, hypertensive, and is already deceased. The third child, no disease, but is already dead or already deceased and for the fourth child which is the patient's um, father male is hypertensive now let's move on to the maternal side of um, the patient so for um, the fe uh, the male on the maternal side already deceased and for the female already deceased and is uh, diabetic and already deceased so that is for the maternal side and they had uh, three children. The eldest is aged 74 years old, um, hypertensive, and already deceased. The second child is a male, um, diabetic, already deceased. The third child is 68 years old, uh, multiple gestation, a female, 68 years old, multiple gestation, already deceased. And the fourth child is a male, Still alive and without disease, healthy, 65 years old. And lastly, the fifth child, which is the mother of our patient, uh, 64 years old, alive, healthy, without disease. And um, for the maternal and paternal side, um, here are the siblings of the patient. The patient, uh, they are six, uh, six siblings in total. Uh, the eldest is a male, which is hypertensive, aged 46 years old. The second child is a female, also hypertensive, aged is 43 years old. The third child is a male, healthy, alive, healthy, without disease, 41 years old. And this is our, the fourth child is our patient. Uh, it is marked with a diagonal line, female. Uh, multiple gestation already and is hypertensive and um, the younger sibling or the fifth child in the family is a 36 years, years old a, fe a 36 year old female uh, alive alive healthy without disease and lastly the youngest sibling of the patient is a male aged 32 years old uh, alive alive, healthy, and without disease. So that is all for the uh, genogram of the patient. So we can see here that both the maternal and paternal sides, okay, they have uh, traces of hypertension in the family, which is um, the case of the mother also in this, um, in our case, uh, case study, the patient is hypertensive. So that would be all for the um, ninth chapter, which is the genogram. Okay, we, we are now proceeding to the 10th chapter. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm back again, Margil Antahong, and I'm going to discuss our pathophysiology in this modified case presentation. Now, for our pathophysiology, let us discuss first the precipitating factor identified. The precipitating factor that we identified is obesity. So I'm going to begin discussing the left part. So obesity leads to increased fat in the body and this leads to an increased workload on the heart. This is the factor that contribute to the disease condition. Then, next, obesity also leads to increased angiotensinogen that rise, and, and this rise leads to a stimulation of the reticular activating system. This stimulation leads to a decrease in microsomal protein yield, 
and agati related protein. The decrease in these factors leads to an increase in proprio melanocortin, and this stimulates the sympathetic nervous system that contributes to the disease condition. So this increase in sympathetic nervous system um, leads to or contributes to the patient having hypertension. Next is the incitation of the reticular activating system also leads to an increase in sodium reabsorption and volume overload, which also leads to hypertension. Obesity also leads to an increase in interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 beta, C-reactive protein, tumor necrosis factor, and reactive oxygen species. This increase leads to inflammation. The inflammation leads to a decrease in nitric oxide and leads um, to an increase in endothelin 1. So this uh, increase in endothelin 1 leads to endothelial dysfunction. The endothelial dysfunction um, then leads to a factor that contributes to hypertension. These are the increased arterial stiffness and vessel constriction. Now, in this page is the identified predisposing factor, which are the multiple gestations. Multiple gestations lead to abnormal uterine vascular remodeling, then this leads to reduced placental perfusion, and the reduced placental perfusion leads to hypoxia. Hypoxia leads to placental dysfunction, and then this causes a release of placental mediators in maternal circulation. Then this leads to systemic endothelial dysfunction that contributes to the occurrence of hypertension in pregnancy. By the way, on the right below are our legends. The pink box is the precipitating and predisposing factors. The light blue box is the process of the precipitating and predisposing factors. Then, the yellow box is the factor that will contribute to the disease condition, which is the hypertension. Below that is the pathophysiology. The light green color box is the patient's manifestation or complications. Then, we have the diagnostic and laboratory test, and the green color is the nursing management. So, those are our legends. Then, here you see the factors that contribute to the disease condition, and this leads to vasospasm, then vascular effects, and this causes vasoconstriction, which leads to poor organ perfusion that leads to hypertension. So, that's the summarization of all. The diagnostic and laboratory tests that we conduct are complete blood counts, and we also monitor the blood pressure. Then for the nursing management, we administer amlodipine of 10 milligrams and hydralazine of um, 5 milligrams. So that's all for our pathophysiology. Now let's proceed to our drug study that will be discussed by Ms. Tabo Tabo. Hello everyone, again my name is Karen Kate Aktabutabo and I will now discuss my last assigned topics but not the last topic in this um, uh, case presentation. So I will be discussing the drug study. So um, obviously I will be discussing the drugs involved in our um, case. So since our patient undergone a twin uh, pregnancy and hypertension, we will expect that we will see uh, medications that are involved in pain relief, uh, relieving of hypertension, and even antibacterial medication. So, we can now begin our drug study. So, for the first um, drug that is involved, which is a very typical drug that is administered to every mother in every pregnancy, whether it's normal or it's um, um, CS, the oxytocin. So, 
Um, oxytocin is from a group of oxytoxics and the usual dosage as um, we nurses know it, it will be a 10 units and it is administered intramuscularly. So the oxytocin stimulates uterine contraction by activating the G protein coupled receptors that triggers the increase in intracellular calcium levels in the uterine my myofibrils. So oxytocin also increases the local prostaglandin production for further stimulation of the um, uterine contraction. So we will discuss in all drugs today from its generic name down to its significance. So for the indication is that it is a uterine stimulant. Um, it is used for, again, uterine contraction to induce labor as well as stimulate contraction in cases for um, if the uterus does not contract enough during labor or if the uterus is not contracting at all. So it is important for cases for incomplete abortion, miscarriage, as well as decreased postpartum hemorrhage. So it is for the prevention of um, too much bleeding or blood loss from our mother after labor. So it is, in, it is indeed indicated to pregnant laboring women, as, women rather, especially for our patient which delivered a twin and shows high blood pressure that uh, rises her blood and then there are uh, blood loss in our patient. So for the contraindications, so it is contraindicated for cephalopelvic disproportion, which the baby's head is too large to fit through the mother's pelvis. Why? Because oxytocin simulates contraction that prevents bleeding. And if that happens, the baby's head will be um, stuck and it, there will be difficulty of delivering the baby since the um, uterine is contracted. Also, it is also contraindicated for abnormal presentations of our fetus if there are excessive amniotic fluid, if women have had multiple pregnancies or pre in previous cesarean sections, um, or other uterine surgery. So, hyperactive and hypertonic surgery, uh, uterine rupture, also in cases of uh, if vaginal delivery is um, not recommended due to high blood pressure. So for the, the side effects, so for the GI, there will be a rupture of uterus and increased tone of our uterine muscle. Uh, there, for our neonate, it will cause jaundice, um, slow heart rate, a low APGAR score, a seizure. Um, and for the mother, there will be a low blood pressure, however, fast heart rate, nasal irritation, runny nose and tears, uterine um, uh, bleeding, violent contraction, increased tone of uterus and spasm, nausea, nausea, and vomiting. So for the heart, there will be a premature ventricular contractions, uh, water intoxication with convulsion. Um, for other is it may have allergies, absence of fibrinogen in the plasma that could be fatal, and blood clot in the pelvic region however all of this may or may not always occur to every mother receiving the oxytocin so for the adverse reaction it includes headache tachycardia and bradycardia so for our nursing responsibilities oxytocin administration during our labor labor rather so during labor is yes, we will titrate it usually um, and administer it with the infusion pump so start a primary line with uh, 1000 ml of IV fluid and we will mix the oxytocin into the mainline IV to connect to the port nearest to the IV insertion. So oxytocin by infusion pump. So we must titrate the infusion according to the client and fetal uh, response. Then that is during the labor. Then we will administer again oxytocin during postpartum, during the live after delivery. So usually it is most likely on intramuscular um, administration, our 10 units will be uh, administered intramuscularly. Then after that, we will monitor the fundal height, the um, position, the vital signs, uh, ask our client if she feels any pain or there are any bleeding. So the significance of oxytocin is a um, potent stimulator again of con contraction. 
which helps dilate the cervix, moves the baby down faster out of the mother's um, body, and give birth um, to the placenta spontaneously and limits the bleeding side of the placenta. And patient MCA was significantly in need of oxytocin since she gave birth to twins with 20 minutes interval and she was showing signs of high blood pressure and blood loss thus oxytocin was highly concerned in this situation so that is for our oxytocin next is our ciproxim this is the another other drug that is advised for our client to take so ciproxim is a cephalosporin antibiotics so we are now dealing with antibiotics so for the dosage, our client is ordered to take 500 milligrams of one tab for seven days. And it is a ciproxim broad spectrum, spectrum second generation cephalosporin antibiotic. So it hinders um, bacterial um, infection or stops bacterial infection. So it is given before so for some surgical procedures such as infection to keep infection at bay so it is indicated to laboring women also since they are exposed to bacteria they are open to um, bacteria in the surrounding during labor so cefirxime works by destroying the bacteria that are causing infection so it is safe to use in both adult and children and also it can be taken while the mother is still pregnant <coughs> excuse me so for the contraindication, when used in um, pregnancy, there may now there may not uh, some drug related hazard, and it is only if and only if needed should the medicine be used during pregnancy, because the ferroxime is already excreted in the human milk, and it may it may be necessary to temporarily temporarily stop nursing while on ciproxime medication so what we mean by temporarily stop nursing which means we stop ang um, breastfeeding sa atong baby if we are on ciproxime medication but this is only in case to case basis so uh, for the side effects so we have um, chills diarrhea fever discomfort headache itching of the vagina um, um, dryness pain and sexual intercourse rigidity sweat sweating where where there is a thick white vaginal discharge with no other with a mild or no other or with a mild odor so that are the side effects of ciproxime as for the adverse reaction the same it may cause diarrhea jarish um um Herzheimer, then vaginitis also are indicated then for the nursing responsibility before starting therapy check for the history of the hypersensitivity um, reactions to cephalosporin and penicillins as well as the history of our client for allergies so particularly to medicines also then we will result if um, onset of stools since proxim absorption is aided by meals so we will see if after after um, taking the medication if there are any rashes or super infections and we must report it to the prescriber or the physician of our client so its significance is again it is used to treat bacterial infections such as pneumonia and urinary tract infections thus it is very significant to laboring women to prevent any bacteria by entering through her system since uh, as you all know they are, their genitalia is open during the procedure next is the mephenamic acid so mephenamic acid is generic name and um I'm so sorry I forgot to put its classification, but it is an an NSAIDs. Uh, it is a group of NSAID, so they are non-steroidal inflammatory drug. So it means they are in in anti-inflammatory drug. So they they inhibit um, inflammation to um, the person taking it. So same 500 milligrams. Then the mechanism of action is that it binds. <coughs> To the prostaglandin synthesis, uh, synthase receptors, our COX and uh, COX2 inhibiting the action of prostaglandin uh, synthase. So for the indication, the mephenamic acid is a type of a painkiller, so anti-inflammatory that the uh, doctor prescribed 
um, caused by arthritis, a recent operation, or heavy periods. So, um, they belong to a group called again the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, if it is in if it is prescribed to for painkiller, uh, I mean for for um recent operation arthritis. So, it is also prescribed to the women. Um, undergoing labor, delivery, and recovery after the after the baby is delivered, since we all know that um, blood are expelled uh, after of our mother, so there will be um, pain and swelling uh, around the genitals of our mother as well as the insides, not only the outer. So, in individuals with acute active um, ulceration or chronic inflammation. To the upper and lower GI tract, methanamic acid is contraindicated. Um, so, if also if our clients has pre-existing renal illness, methanamic acid are also um, avoided because again it inhibits the action of our prostaglandin as synthase as prostaglandin is a um, local prostaglandin also aids the contraction. So, it is contraindicated to GI problems and renal illnesses. So for the side effects, we have here a various side effects. The in the in, in a bullet form we have blood bloody urine, bloody black or tarry stools, heartburn, increased bleeding time, increased blood pressure, increased thirst, indigestion, itching, loss of appetite, nausea, pale skin, uh, swelling, trouble breathing, uh, weakness, vomiting, weight gain or weight loss. As for the adverse effects, um, systems of allergic reaction also may occur, such as sneezing, runny nose, stuffy nose, uh, fever, sore throat, burning eyes, skin rash, or blisters might uh, also be the, the adverse reaction while taking a methanamic acid. So for the nursing responsibilities, we must closely monitor the blood pressure during the initiation throughout the course of treatment. So we must not drive or engage into potentially dangerous activities until the drug's response has been determined. So it can make uh, the patient feel dizzy if we did not um, educate the patient properly. So we, we will also educate that they may not, uh, they should not uh, breastfeed while taking the medication without first seeing the doctor. As for its significance, methanamic acid is significant in postpartum women because it is relief from pain after delivery process. So, methanamic acid is a painkiller or anti-inflammatory drug. Next is a very familiar drug for hypertension which is the amlodipine. So, amlodipine is a, in a group of uh, calcium channel blockers. So, the dosage given to our patient is a 10 mg one tab. Uh, per oral so the mechanism it inhibits the transmembrane influx of calcium ions it um, into vascular smooth and cardiac muscle so it is indicated because amlodipine is used for patients with hypertension so for post for postpartum mother who showed high levels of bp during four stages of labor which is the condition of patient mca so we have a very um lengthy contraindication of amlodipine so i will read only some important parts so amlodipine should not be taken with any other medication that slow down the heart rate such as beta blockers because amlodipine is expected to lower the um, pressure the high blood pressure as well as the heart rate and if it is um uh um, taken with also beta blockers that also lowers the heart rate there will be um, a very low heart rate for the patient which is not um, um, advisable unless it was prescribed by the doctor so um, slowing of the heart rate can also be dangerous too much slowing of the heart rate is dangerous because um, amlodipine lowers the heart rate as well as beta blockers so when taking amlodipine alongside other drugs that promote vasodilation such as uh, sesterbide and hydralazine must be taken with great caution so amlodipine should not be used with grapefruit juice 
components that inhibit amyloidopane metabolism. So it is um, contraindicated to um, drinks that contraindicates amyloidopane. So amyloidopane is metabolized again mostly in the liver. So this is a pharmacokinetic metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. So the kidneys are the major excretors of amlodipine. So amlodipine cannot be excreted regularly, regularly by people who have kidney disease. As a result, this medication may remain in circulation for longer periods of time and may be harmful. As a result, in patients with impaired renal function, amlodipine should be used with caution. As for the side effects, um, it will or show signs of swelling, ankles, less uh, tightness of the chest, breathing that is rough, dizziness, fast heartbeat, with erratic, racing, pounding, um, pulse, and a warm sensation in the face, neck, arms, and on occasions. So, um, Lodipin's adverse reaction includes edema, hot flushes, so it is also indicated here, and palpitations. For the nursing responsibilities, we must monitor the blood pressure of the patient if there is a reduction or greatest af or great levels after the peak levels of amlodipine, amlodipine is achieved around 6 to 9 hours. Then um, we will monitor the dose related, the facial edema, the postural changes while, we'll take a, while we are taking the BP. And we must report postural hypotension. Monitor more frequently when, addi with, when additional antihypertensives or diuretics are added. So, that is for the amlodipine that is administered to our client. So, it is significant for blood pressure control and it causes relaxation and dilation of the blood vessels leading to lowering of blood pressure. So next, next is hydralazine. So it is a little bit similar to omlodipine, but um, it also it aids the vessels of uh, the patient that is um, blood pressure. So uh, hydralazine again is a vasodilator, so it dilates vessels. So it is a um, five milligrams IVTT. So because our patient after the delivery has 160 over 90 um, uh, blood pressure level. So, its mechanism of action, it conducts the blood pressure lowering effects by vasoconstrictive repression. So, in other words, vasodilation. So, hydralazine lowers high blood pressure. So, this medication is indicated for mothers who showed signs of high blood pressure from prenatal stages to the four stages of labor. labor. So contraindication, hypersensitivity to hydralazine, coronary artery disease, and mitral valvular rheumatic heart disease. So as for the side effects, so we have here the most common pain in the arms, back or jaw, um, chest discomfort, stiffness, heaviness of chest, heartbeat or pulse um, that is rapid, hammering or irregular, nausea, breathing problems, and sweating. As for the adverse effects, adverse effects rather, um, when the dosage of hydralazine um, is lowered, adverse responses are frequently reversible in some situations, though it may be necessary to stop taking the medication. The following adverse events have been documented, but not enough systemic data has been collected to justify a frequency estimate. However, the most common adverse effects of this are headache, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, Palpitation, tachycardia, angina pectoris are all symptoms that can show if we take hydralazine. Then, for the nursing responsibilities, um, uh, it may lower the blood pressure, but it will not cure the blood pressure. So, we must encourage the patient to follow uh, through with subsequent hypertension treatments. Um, such as low sodium diet, smoking cessation, or um, it means smoking cessation, we must stop smoking. So, moderation of alcohol intake or do not take alcohol at all, regular exercise, and stress management. So, we must instruct the patient as well as the family on how to properly check the blood pressure of the patient. 
for its significance, the high blood pressure is treated with the drug um, hydralazine. So it is for hypertension again. So it is used to treat also in um, preeclampsia and eclampsia. So preeclampsia is um, where the mother shows uh, hypertension, uh, proteinuria, and edem edema. Well, eclampsia um, shows signs of seizures to the mother, so in pregnant women, as well as in emergency cases where blood pressure is dangerously high. So the heart arteries work harder when blood pressure is high, thus hydralazine is a very important drug to give to our patient. Next is the iron folic acid. So classifications of this are the iron products, the vitamins, and some mineral combinations. So one tab once a day for one month. So folic acid work closely with vitamin B12 in making red blood cells and helps iron functions properly in the body. Since there are um, expected um, uh, 500 uh, ml in normal delivery blood loss to mother, so thus iron folic acid is very important to aid the mother. So it is indicated to reduce, to reduce the incidences of maternal anemia. Then it is used to prevent or treat the low irons in the body. It is used to treat also low folate levels and it is used to help the growth for growth and good health. So it is contraindicated for pernicious anemia, intestinal uh, diverticular or any intestinal obstruction, um, hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis, patients receiving repeated blood transfusion, and concomitant parenteral iron um, therapy. So it is uh, contraindicated for pernicious anemia because um, folic acid work closely with vitamin B B12 and pernicious anemia shows um, lack of vitamin B12. And for the side effects, we have stomach cramps, constipation, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, and iron may impact the stools by turning them black. Then the same with the adverse reaction, we will uh, patient will experience GI discomfort, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, black feces, which are all possible side effects of the iron ther therapy. However, the side effects are usually short lived. <coughs> um, next is for the nursing responsibilities. So first, we will assess if there are any, the patient is allergic to any. Um, folic acid preparations uh, such as if our patient have pernicious anemia, plastic, normocytic, or a problem in lactation. So, um, we must get the CBC, HGB, HCT serum folate levels, uh, serum vitamin D12 levels, shilling test, um, advanced tool sounds, and if it will it is also possible to administer it orally it can be also uh, be given intramuscularly intravenously subcutaneously uh, if there are problem in gi um, absorption so to rule out pernicious anemia we must use the shilling test and serum and serum vitamin and serum vitamin 12 levels well, the, the, the neurologic decline progresses, the therapy might discuss indication of pernicious anemia. So, warning, we must keep an eye to patient for hypersensitivity reactions again. And if there are allergies after given this medication, the same process, we must, um, as nurses, we must report it to the physician. So, significance of it is it is given to postpartum mothers because they lose blood while giving birth. And in the case of patient MCA, so this is MCA, she was agitated during delivery, has high blood pressure, her IV is having a great amount of blood block flow due to too much pressure. Thus, she significantly needs to take iron folic supplements um, such as um, this iron folic acid. So iron aids in the metabolism of proteins and is necessary for the creation of our RBCs or our red blood cells and the hemoglobin in the body as well as the transport of oxygen by the RBCs. Folic acid also known as folate or the vitamin B9 is a nutrient that is necessary for a variety, variety of processes including the cell repair and maintaining 
uh, and the maintenance of the blood so leukocyte and erythrocyte um, production so also dna synthesis in amino acid and uh, metabolism plays a great role for the iron folic acid to function in the body of the mother so lastly is the multivitamin so this is the last drugs that is prescribed to our um, patient so it is in the group of vitamins usually this is a mixed um, um, variations of vitamins from vitamin uh, uh, A, C, E, A to Z vitamins that is um, recommended to our client that can be easily uh, bought in our uh, near pharmacies and our vicinity. So one capsule for one month. So vitamins are chemical partners for enzymes involved in metabolism and cell synthesis to tissue repair and other critical functions in the body. For its indication, postnatal multivitamins are designed exclusively for women who have recently given birth. So the vitamins provide nutrients that assist postpartum and um, breastfeeding nutrient demand. Well, a uh, well-balanced diet can also help the mother fulfill nutrient requirements Supplements can help women acquire enough vital nutrients after giving birth since our mother experienced extraneous um, pressure while giving birth, thus it is um, expected to take vitamins to go back to the usual strength of the mother. So it is contraindicated uh, even though that it, is, it helps um, enzymes, metabolism, tissue repair, um, too much vitamin is still uh, life-threatening so we must also avoid taking identical vitamin pills together if multivitamin supplements contains a lot of potassium um, women should cease using salt substitute in their diet so its side effect is light nausea and uh, unpleasant taste as for the adverse reaction um, there might be agitation allergic reaction dizziness, double vision, iron overdose, if not um, taken properly, uh, fat-soluble vitamin overdose affects a GI system, and taste alteration. So for the nursing responsibilities, before we administer the patient education about multivitamins, we must inform the physician about the patient's medical conditions if our patient has any allergies, and we must ask a doctor before using the medicine for pregnant women if she is allowed to breastfeed and the dose uh, needs may be different during pregnancy and some vitamins and minerals can harm an unborn baby if taken in large doses so for the significance multivitamins are designed to meet the daily requirements for vitamin and minerals that are necessary for a healthy and a balanced diet it is significant to patient mca because she gave birth uh, to twins and she showed signs of high blood pressure due to exerted effort during labor, labor. Multivitamins will aid her gain her activeness for fast recovery. So that is all for the drug study, the drugs involved um, in this case for our um, mother. So that is all for my report in drug study. Thank you very much and I will now um, this has been Kathleen Kate F. Tabotabo, and I will now pass the floor to my classmate to discuss the laboratory exams. Thank you. Again, good day, Dr. Kual. I am Julia V. Tevez, and I will now be reporting on the laboratory and diagnostic exam findings of the patient. So let me begin with the chapter 12, which is the laboratory exam. Next slide, please. So for our laboratory exam, a complete blood count, commonly known as CBC, was conducted. So CBC, next slide please. CBC or complete blood count is a group of tests that evaluates cells that circulate in blood, including RBC or red blood cell, white, uh, WBC or white blood cell, and platelets. So we have here in our table, our normal values, the results, in the significance. So let us begin with the hemoglobin. So um, by the way, hemoglobin and hematocrit um, has something to do with anemia. So if a patient's hemoglobin level is lower than the normal level, she may have 
iron deficiency anemia. Also, there's, uh, there has been studies that suggest that high hemoglobin concentration during the early pregnancy is asso it's associated with an increased risk of stillbirth. So here in our table, the normal values of hemoglobin for female is between 11 to 16 gram percent and for males, it is between 13 to 18 gram percent. And the patient's hemoglobin level is 12.1 gram percent, which means that it is within the normal values of 11 to 16 gram percent. So the significance of hemoglobin level, hemoglobin level, level is normal. And next is our hematocrit. So hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells in a person's blood. Um, low red blood cell levels indicate conditions such as anemia, as I've made mentioned previously. And high red blood cell levels could signal uh, polycythemia, which can increase a person's risk of developing a blood clot. So knowing both hemoglobin and hematocrit levels are important, so that if findings suggest that you have anemia, your doctor can advise you to take iron supplements. So if you have anemia during pregnancy, uh, your baby may not be able to grow to a healthy weight or the baby may have uh, you may have a preterm birth the baby may arrive early or the baby may have a low birth weight that's why it's very important to take iron supplements if you if you're having um, uh, if you're having um, iron deficiency anemia during your pregnancy so for our hematocrit levels, the normal values is between, for females, it is between 37 to 47 volume percent, and for males, it is between 40 to 50 volume percent. And the patient's hematocrit uh, result, or hematocrit level, is 36.2 volume percent. It is below the normal level of 37 percent, which makes the significance decreased. And the next is the WBC count. So um, normally, a, a high WBC count indicates that there is something wrong in your body and situations such as uh, uh, there is infection. But typically, a uh, white blood cell count will be higher during pregnancy because the body is going through a lot of stress. So here in our table, referring to our table, the normal values of WBC count should be between 4.5 to 11.0 CUMM or cubic millimeter. And our patient's WBC count is 16.97 per CUMM or per cubic millimeter. That means that it's um, higher than the normal, which is 11.0 uh, per CUMM. The significance is increased. Then um, below that, we have our differential count. So the differential count measures the numbers of the different types of white blood cells in the sample. So um, in general, if your uh, differential count in the CBC test is below normal, your body is more susceptible to infection. So on our first um, row for differential count, we have the neutrophil. So when the body has um, too few neutro neutrophils or the, your neutrophil level is below the normal percentage, um, this condition, we have a condition which is called neutropenia. So when you have neutropenia, your body is having a hard time fighting off pathogens. And as a result, um, you would be more susceptible or you would be more likely to get sick from infections. So here, referring to our table, the normal values of neutrophil should be between 55 to 70%. And our patient's neutrophil level or neutrophil result is 77%, which is 7% higher than the normal, which makes the significance increased. And the next, on the next um, our row is our band. The normal values is between zero to 10%, and the results is, is absent, or um, the significance also absent. And for the lymphocyte, it is between uh, 20 to 30%, the normal values is, is between 20-30% and the patient's um, lymphocyte result is 14% 40, which is 6% lower than the no, um, lower bracket of the normal value which is 20%. The significance is decreased. And for our BLAST, it is uh, the normal values should be between 0 to 1% only 
this absent significance is abs also and for the eosinophil it is between 1 to 4 percent the normal values is between 1 to 4 percent uh, the patient's eosinophil result is 5 percent which means it is 1 percent higher than the higher bracket of the normal value the significance is increased and for the monocyte the normal values is between 2 to 8 percent and the patient's monocyte result is 4 percent which is between the bracket of the normal values of monocyte levels significance is normal so next slide please so the next laboratory exam is urinalysis so next slide so urinalysis is a test to check the presence of sugar protein ketones bacteria and blood cells in the urine specimen it can help find problems that need treatment, including infections or kidney problems. A urinalysis involves checking the appearance, the concentration, and the content of urine. So for our, we have again our normal values, our result, and our significance. So for the physical examination of, our, of the patient's urine, we have the color, the transparency, and the specific gravity. So um, the color, sh the, the normal color of urine should be yellow. The patient's results is also yellow, which means it is normal. And for transparency, the normal value should be clear. While the patient's results, it is slightly turbid. The urine is slightly turbid. Um, significance is abnormal. So if your um, uh, urine transparency is not clear or it is not normal, um, it could be a sign that you have urinary tract infection. And the next is the specific gravity. So the specific gravity, the normal values is between 1.008 to 1.030. And for the results, the specific gravity of the urine of the patient is 1.025, which means it is normal. The next, we have the chemical examination of the urine. First is blood. The normal value should be negative. The patient's result is negative, which means it is normal. Next is bilirubin. The normal value is negative. The patient's bilirubin result is negative. Significance is normal. Next is serobilinogen. The normal value should be, be, uh, should be less than one milligram per deciliter. And the patient's uh, result is 0 0.8 mg per dl which means it is also normal and for the ketones the normal value is negative the results is uh, the patient's ketone result is negative there is absence of ketone which means it is normal and for the protein the normal value should be less than 0 0.3 grams per day the result is one plus it is between the normal uh, values of 0 0.3, uh, less than 0 0.3 grams per day, which makes the uh, significance normal. And down to our uh, nitrite, the normal values should be negative of nitrite. The patient um, nitrite result is negative, normal. Significance is normal. And for the glucose, the normal values is between 0 to 0 0.8 um, mm, mmol per liters. Uh, the result is negative and the significance is normal. For the pH level, the normal values is between 4.7 to 7.7. .7. Um, the patient's um, pH result is 6.5, which is between the normal values. And next is the leukocytes. It should be negative. There should be um, negative leukocytes for the normal values. For the results, it is, it is 2 plus, which means the significance is increased. Next slide, please. And for the microscopic examination of uh, the urinalysis test, we have the post cells. Um, the normal values is between 2.5 
per HPF and the patient's result is 15 to 20 per HPF which means it is far from the normal levels it is increased the next is the RBC or the red blood cells the normal values is between 2 to 4 per HPF and the patient's um, red blood cell result in the urine is 2.4 per HPF which is normal next is the epithelial cells for the no normal values it should be between 0 to 3 per HPF and the patient's um, epithelial cell result is 4 to 5 per HPF which is um, 1 to 2 higher than normal values significance is increased next is bacteria so bacteria should be absent should be uh, absent in your in the uh, your urinas test the normal values should be negative the patient's uh, bacteria results in the urine test is moderate which means it is increased and for the casts the normal value is between 0 to 5 hyaline cast per LTF um, there is no findings in the patient's chart but it is listed there that calcium oxalate is abundant next is crystals the normal value is occasionally it was not um, it is marked um, blank in the patient's chart so uh, significance is also um, not listed next slide please so on our um, 13th chapter we have the diagnostic exam next slide please so for our diagnostic exam we have ultrasonography so ultrasonography ultrasonography is a test that provides information about a baby's growth development and overall health diagnostic ultrasound is used to view and provide information about other internal parts of the body these include the heart the blood vessels, the liver, the bladder, the kidneys, and the female reproductive organs. So in our ultrasonography, we have our results and the significance of each result. For the fetal lie or presentation, it is cephalic breach. Significance, twin A is positioned bottom, bottom and feet up with head near birth canal. Um, that is for cephalic and um, twin B is positioned with both knees bent and feet and bottom closest to the birth canal that is for twin B that is the reason why the fetal lie or presentation for this twin pregnancy is cephalic breach twin A is phallic and twin B is um, breach next is for our placenta the result for our placenta findings, it is according to the oceanography, is high lying. Significance: twin fetus will be able to grow and descend into anterior position and align in the birth canal for vaginal birth. Next, for the result of the amniotic fluid, it is adequate. It means that the twin fetus is healthy. Next, for our Cardiac activity according to the ultrasonography findings, twin A, 148 BPM, twin B, 155 BPM. So um, both uh, cardiac activity of twin A and twin B are within the average fetal heart rate of 110 to 160 BPM. It means that twin A and twin B are both getting enough oxygen and are healthy. The next is our biometry. So for our biometry, we have the biparietal diameter or BPD. Twin A is 85 uh, millimeters. Twin B is 84 millimeters. So for twin A, 85 millimeters, the fetal age of twin A is 33 weeks and 6 days. So by the way, biometry is um, a way of uh, determining or estimating or calculating the gestational age or the age of the fetus so again for twin a 85 millimeters and uh, fetal age of twin a is 33 weeks and 6 days for twin b 84 millimeters the fetal age of twin b is 33 weeks and 6 days 
next is our femoral length or FL. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So for our femoral length, um, twin A is 65 millimeters, twin B is 66 millimeters. So for twin A, the fetal age of twin A is 33 weeks and 6, six days. And for twin B, 66 millimeters, the fetal age of twin B is 33 weeks and 0 days. Next is the head circumference. For twin A, it is 303 millimeters. For twin B, 305 millimeters. For twin A, 303 millimeters, the fetal age is 33 weeks and 6 days. Twin B, 305 millimeters. Fetal age of twin B is 33 weeks and, six, and 3 days. The next is for the abdominal circumference, AC. Twin A, 300 mm. Twin B, 303 mm. The fetal age of twin A, 303 mm for abdominal circumference, is 34 weeks and 1 day. And the fetal age of twin B, 303 mm, is 34 weeks and 1 day. So overall, the estimated fetal weight of the twin um, fetus, twin A, it is 2,612 grams. For twin B, it's 2,636 grams. And the estimated date of delivery, according to the um, findings, um, the estimated date of delivery of the mother is April 8, 2022. So that would be all for um, chapter 13, which is uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13, which is laboratory exam and diagnostic exam, respectively. So we are now on um, the next part of our presentation. Next slide. So next, I'm going to discuss about the nursing care plan that we will, that are presented. So for the nursing care plan, we have three nursing care plans um, that is according to their priorities. For the priority one, we have the nursing diagnosis, acute pain related to inflammation of the renew as evidenced by facial grimace. So the subjective view that we have, the patient verbalizes, maayo raman ng ako pamino pero naay usahin mo to para ang sakit sa akong pinatao. The, pa the patient re um, rate the pain um, accordingly. So the pain is 4 over 10. So um, 0 which is um, no pain at all and pain 10 as um, very painful. For the objective views, Expression of pain and discomfort, facial dreamies, and guarding. For the pl plan and objectives, within four hours of nursing care, the patient will be able to number one, report reduction of the pain, number two, verbalize improvement of condition or comfort, number three, gain more ability for movement, such as going to the comfort room, number four, demonstrate postpartum wellness and caring in the infant itself. For the interventions, for the ind independent intervention, number one, we need to explain discomforts and reassure the patient that they are time limited. We, number two, we need to assist the patient on needs like in going, in going to toilet and in, the cha in changing positions as necessary. Number three, apply a healing pad to the suprapubic area or lower back. Number four, oh. Okay, but before that, I'm going to um, discuss the rationality of the, the, the interventions. For number one, the natural rationality of it is to deal with the psychological source of the pain and, and provide comfort. For number two, to assist in coping with pain. And for number three, to assist while patient is still developing independence and provide comfort. For number four, use of pharmacological techniques for pain management such as relaxation, ma massage, guided imagery and more discussion as appropriate. So the 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 nursing um the rationale if it is it may decrease pain and provide comfort as well. So for the inter independent intervention for number one, 
you need to administer ciclorexime, um, 500 mg, as um, ordered by the doctor. It is used to treat bacterial infections such as pneumonia, urinary tract infections. So for the evaluation, um, within four hours of nursing care, the patient has able to report reduction of the pain, verbalized improvement of conditions of comfort, and uh, um, the patient gained more ability to move uh, for movement such as going to the comfort room and the patient has demonstrated postpartum wellness in um, carrying the infant and self. So for the um, for continuation of the dependent intervention, um, see follow foreign antibiotic medication as ordered. So um, number two, administer mifenamic acid, a non-steroidal steroidal anti-inflammatory drug as ordered by the physician. So it aids relief from pain after delivery. So for the collaborative intervention, we need to perform perennial care every now and then and hot seats, bath, and heat lump treatment as ordered by the doctor, of course. So this will promote faster healing of the wound. So next for priority two, the nursing, um, nursing care plan, um, the nursing diagnosis, fatigue related to decreased hematocrit level as evidenced by lack of energy. So the sub subjective cue that we have, the patient verbalized, wala ramay koy gibati nga sakit pero mura kong malipong, kinahanglan kung mutindog, kinahanglan jud na'y mutabang na ako lapina mo at sa CR, kay mangiging, unya ang lay akong lawas. The objective cues that we obtained, Hematocrit level, 36.2 vol volume percent. So, um, also, lack of energy, inability to maintain usual routines, and ADLs with no assistance. So, for the plan and objectives, within 24 hours nursing care of nursing care, the patient will be able to verbalize understanding of the use of energy conservation principles. Number two, Verbalized reduction of fatigue as evidenced by reports of increased energy and ability to perform desired activities. For the interventions, we have the independent interventions. Number one, um, planned care to allow for rest periods involve client and work watcher in schedule planning. So this frequent rest periods in naps are needed to restore and conserve energy. So planning will allow patient, a patient to be active during times when energy level is higher, which may restore the feeling of well, uh, uh, feel, feeling of well-being and a sense of control. Number two, assisted to assume comfortable position for rest to promote rest for the mother. And number three, Encourage the watcher to stay at the bedside always. So to assist patients need especially going to the bathroom and to secure the mother's safety. For the dependent intervention, administer iron folic acid as ordered by the physician. So iron aids in the metabolization of proteins and is necessary for the creation of red blood cells and hemoglobin in the body, as well as the transport, transport of oxygen by RBS. So folic acid is also known as folic acid or vitamin B9 is a nutrient that is necessary for the uh, uh, for a variety of um, body processes including um, cell repair and maintenance leukocyte and erythrocyte production DNA synthesis and amino acid metabolism for the collaborative collaborative intervention we need to monitor hemoglobin hematocrit, RBC counts, and retocolocyte counts. So the decreased of RBC in indexes are associated with decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So it is critical to compare serial, serial no labor laboratory values to evaluate progression or deterioration in the client and to identify changes before they become potentially life-threatening. So for the evaluation, within 24 hours of nursing care, the patient is able to verbalize understanding and the use of energy conservation principles. So also, the client verbalizes reduction of fatigue 
as evidenced by reports of increase of energy and ability to perform desired activities. So for the priority, number three, we have the nursing diagnosis risk for decreased cardiac output related to hypertension. So for the subjective cue, medyo makabati kung sa ulo. So the objective cues that we have, the patient is lethargic, the vital sign is taken as follows, BP 140 over 100, which is um, abnormal, PR 121 BPM, abnormal as well. The temperature is 36.2, which is normal, and re respiratory rate 22 BPM, um, which is abnormal as well. So for the plan and objectives, after six hours of nursing interventions, the client will have, will have no elevation in blood pressure above normal limits and will maintain blood pressure within acceptable, acceptable limits. So the client also will remain adequate cardiac output and cardiac index. For the intervention, for the independent interventions, monitor, we need to monitor and record BP, measure in both arms and thighs three times, three to five minutes apart while the patient is at rest, then sitting, then standing for initial, initial evaluation. For the, um, for the rationale, changes in BP may indicate changes in patient status requiring prompt attention. Number two, observe skin color, moisture, temperature, and capillary ratio. So the rationale of it, presence of color, cool, moist skin, and delayed capillary refill may be due to peripheral vasoconstriction. Number three, pro provide calm, restful environment. Um, this will help to reduce sympathetic stimulation. For the dependent, um, um, dependent intervention, the doctor's prescription of calcium channel blocker and vasodilators of amlodipine 10 mg and hydrazolazine 5 mg. So this will reduce blood pressure to a safe level. So also in um, the administration of multivitamins, so to meet the daily requirements uh, for vitamins and minerals that are necessary for a healthy and balanced diet. So for the evaluation, after six hours of nursing intervention, the client has no elevation in blood pressure um, above normal limits and will maintain blood pressure within acceptable limits. Also, the client has maintained ad uh, maintains the adequate cardiac output and cardiac index. So for the continuation, so um, for the collaborative collaborative intervention, um, implement dietary dietary sodium, fat, and cholesterol as indicated. So these restrictions can help manage fluid retention and with the associate, associated um, hypertensive response, decrease myocardial cardial workflow. So that is for the um, collaborative intervention. So that's it for the um, nursing care plans. So, but before we end this report, um, we need to answer this question. So, what will happen if the patient has decreased, this, this decreased rather, hematocrit level upon lab results? So, what do you think is the answer? What would be the symptoms of the patient? So. I will give you time to think. You can pause this video. Okay. So, for the answer, the patient will experience the following. Fatigue, weakness, and low energy. So, that is all for our report. Thank you so much for listening. This is, um, these are our references. So, you can just scan it. So that would be all. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.